Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. I titled this message a message of how God could use what is normally known as uh, second fiddles, or we might say also rans. And the reason this message speaks so much to me is because in a sense I feel very much like that. I feel like I wasn't the one that grew up in a home that had great things given to me. I never, when I played on Little League teams, ever got my uniform dirty because I didn't play in the games. When I went to high school, I wouldn't read on Saturday morning my name in the paper for catching the touchdown pass or running the most yards. I was never the one that would play an instrument well enough to even make the band or the symphony or the orchestra. I was one that wasn't extremely intelligent. I won no scholarships to any school because of my, my brain and my ability. I was one of those that would try to shy away from people probably because I felt like I would embarrass the group that I was with. So I really don't join teams well. I was sharing with the pastors this morning about our basketball team. We have so many basketball players. Some showed up, can't even use them all now on our team. What a great group of people we have playing. And I were wondering maybe why I don't go out there. I remember the one time when I was on faculty at Florida Bible College and they had one of those faculty against the students, faculty against the the team. And so, of course, I had to do it. I was dean of men, of all things. And so I get out there. I want you to know it was horrible. It was pathetic. It was embarrassing. Women were crying and covering up the heads of their kids. You know, I mean, it was terrible. So in a sense, young people, I commend all of you that have been honored in some special way. But I would feel like I was the second fiddle of the also rans. And so for a long time, I felt like, you know, what could I really do? And mainly it would be to applaud others and stay out of their way. I read recently an interview that happened on 60 Minutes with a very, very famous football player. His name was Tom Brady. Most of you that follow football knew that, know that he plays with the um, New England Patriots. And by the time he was, get this, 28 years old, he had already won three Super Bowls by the age of 28. He played in four. He's dated models and actresses. This guy is on the cover of many different magazines and probably even the Wheaties box. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm saying, now, some people could see him and say, well, he's not a second fiddle. He's the whole orchestra. You know, he's not an also ran. He's the only one that needs to run type of guy. And I look at that and I feel sometimes that can we really make it? One man who headed up an orchestra who played the violin so well, outstanding, was asked what piece he played that was the most difficult for him. And he said, second fiddle. And you know, some people have a more difficult time if they've got to step back out of the limelight and be in that particular position. But what I'd like to share with some of you that might feel a little bit of the same pathos that I have felt, that you might feel like, can God ever use me? I'm a second fiddle. I see others that get the awards. They're the ones that sell the most. They get the bonuses and the promotions, and I'm barely able to eke and survive here, and I just feel sometimes left out. I want to tell you that God is also the God of the second fiddles and the also-rans, And there's great potential for each one of us. And so to do that, as you look at all the people that lived during the time of Christ and many of those who chose to follow Christ, and out of that group, Jesus chose 12. And you remember that. Sometimes they're referred to as apostles, sometimes as disciples, but you know the 12. Some of you see the big painting and you see the picture of the Last Supper of the 12, etc. You've seen that. And so I don't have to try to bring you up to speed on that point. But out of those 12, he picked all different types of personalities, different backgrounds, different people in different relationships, even different political viewpoints. And he put them on his team, we might say. And it's interesting because on his team, he chose one gentleman by the name of Andrew on his team. And when he picked this guy, Andrew, on the team, he chose out of this wonderful, stereophonic, beautiful life that Andrew had for three years at least, He chose not to tell us all about Andrew, but just take some snapshots, some digital pictures that he put in Scripture, because he wanted us, who are the second fiddles and the also-rans, to know that there's still wonderful hope 
And there's a purpose for us if we too are willing to stand aside and be like God wants us to be. Going back to this great hero, Tom Brady, he said this very humbly though at the end of his interview when he spoke about his own hunger. And I'm going to quote him exactly from the interview. He said this, Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think that there is something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, Hey man, this is where it's at. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, gosh, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. So a little bit of hope is some of those that are those whole symphonies or those that only need to run like Tom Brady, that even at the end of their day when the dust settles on it and their head hits the pillow, they're still wondering, maybe I'm still a second fiddle and also ran too. And I still can't make sense out of all of it. But I can't look at this man's testimony and say, okay, now that's my motive. That's my model for me to keep on. I would much rather use one that God selected and inspired to be written in Scripture. And so maybe today you and I can take from just the life of Andrew, just a couple of ways that we can see how God can still use us, whatever talent we might have or not, whatever physique we might have or not, or whatever relationship or connection we might have, or might not, or wherever we are in life financially, or nowhere, that God still wants to use you and me, and He does have a plan for us as a second fiddle and also ram. And these are some things that all of us can do, and I'm so excited. Now, I will tell you that this message is specifically designed today for those who already know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, for those of you that are outside that little audience, I want you to peer in and lean into this because you're going to see how even from the very first point of the life of Andrew, you too can be a part of that same family of believers. And those of you now that are out there that still won't become of that model of Andrew, that's okay because we love you so much because from Andrew's life, we're going to learn how that we can even love you more. And so you won't be left out. We're going to connect to you in a different way. And I hope probably the most important and best way for your life we possibly can. And that is to give you eternal meaning and a wonderful home in heaven with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin and answer the question, how can God use you and me as a second fiddle and as an also ran? First thing we can do is we can bring ourselves or bring yourself to Jesus Christ. Now, for the vast majority that are here today, you've already brought yourself to Christ, but for those that are listening on radio or maybe downloading this message, they could be listening to this and they haven't brought themselves to Christ. So let me tell you the story now as Andrew comes up into this picture. So let's read here as I read this to you. It says, again, the next day, John, and that would be John the Baptist, stood with two of John the Baptist's disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to mean teacher, Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying. And they remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour, approximately 10 a.m. in the morning. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Here's what's so interesting about what you've just read is that you hear Andrew's name written. But many of us are still trying to grapple with who are these 12 guys that are part of Jesus' special front team as he starts Christianity. Well, I'd like you to know this, that in this particular list of 12, you're going to find that there are generally four different times that list is mentioned in Scripture. Now, I know this is going to be a little tedious for a moment, but you'll pick this up, the importance in a moment. Four lists. Out of the list, they're mentioned in three groups. In each group, there was four guys, four guys, four guys. That's one group of 12. The next, four guys, four guys, four guys, group of 12. Four guys, four guys, four guys, group of 12. Same guys. Now, what we've learned as we studied these men, and then we look at the history of these men in their relationship to Christ, here's what we have discovered. We've discovered that when the first group is mentioned, that group seems to have the most intimacy with the Lord, those four guys. The next group of guys have a little less intimacy than the first group, but a little more intimacy with the Lord than the third group. Now, they were all close, 
but some seem to be allowed to be pulled up a little bit closer into what we might call the inner circle. We also know out of the list of the 12 that the same people are mentioned in that order and what's interesting is the first person in each group is generally the leader of the group. And you're going to find how often Peter is mentioned. And we know that Peter is the spokesman. He seemed to be the most dominant. He's the one that wasn't afraid to share, to speak, to ask questions, to do things. And so he happened to be in that particular list. What some people now need to know that is out of that list, the first person in each group, usually the most dominant, out of the three groups, Peter is mentioned first. The one who is dead last in the dead last group, and the dead last person is, of course, Judas Iscariot. And so as we look at that, we see Peter is mentioned. Now that's why Peter is going to factor so much into this story because Andrew is a part of that top group of those that would be somewhat intimate with the Lord. But you know, as I look at this passage here, I want you to see something as you look at it very carefully. It says, they heard him speak and then they decided to go where Jesus was and they stayed with him a long time. Now Peter wasn't a part of that. Andrew came and as he's there, I can only imagine that he was asking questions. Now, some of this I'm reading in, this is my thinking. I believe Andrew was one who was very careful and he wanted to know truth. He heard a certain amount about Jesus from John the Baptist. He wanted to discover a little bit more, and so he got up close to Jesus. And throughout the day, he watched Jesus. He listened to Jesus. He was grabbing that information. And it was from that time with Jesus that he had his encounter for all eternity. He himself came to Christ at that time. And so here's what I say to you. You know, a lot of people could control our lives. The government might try to do that. You might have family members that'll do that. Some of you serve a very strong taskmaster of an employer, maybe a supervisor, and you're stressed with that in some measure. And so you feel like you're very much controlled. Young people, you might have that same situation, whether it's in school or whether it's on a team or maybe you have a part-time job or maybe you even have a strong parent. I don't know. But as much as they might control your life, there's one thing that no one can do, and I hope you listen to this. They cannot control what you believe. They can try to do that. They will influence you. They will slam against your thinking as much information to try to change your thinking one direction or the other. But I want you to know that ultimately, what you hear and what you choose to embrace is still part of the free choice that you have as a human being. Now the good news is that God set it up that way and that God in his infinite wisdom is coming alongside of you and he will do everything he can to provide for you truth so that you then would make the right choice. So here's where you're at as a second fiddle, as an also ran. Believing in Christ alone is not made up with how much money you have, nor is it made up with how strong or physical you might be or how well you can play an instrument, or how well you can parlay some money and make a lot more. Your choice of coming to Christ is simply for you to hear the facts. Is Jesus Christ God, yes or no? The answer is yes. Are you a sinner? Can you admit that? Yes, you've broken the law, the moral law of God. Yes, going to heaven cannot be by good works, but only by faith. Jesus died and he rose again. Good truth. Now what you need to do is to take that truth and see it as being truth. Okay, it's truth. I believe it. It is true truth. Now what you do is place your faith in that truth for yourself because Jesus died and he rose again. That's essentially what Andrew did there. Now, for some of you that are on your journey to discover this, it's all right. Andrew just didn't do it right then the first time he heard the name Jesus. He went on that little journey. But here's the difference often between Andrew and others when they're on this journey. Andrew at that time, it says that he went right then and followed Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean he followed him to serve him all of his life, but what he did is he followed Jesus. He wanted to know more truth. Here's what he was doing. He was saying no to the other distractions and things in life, and he put other stuff down, and he said, where are you going, Jesus? I want to go where you're going. I want to watch you. I want to hear you. I want to dialogue. I want to know you. And so if those of you that are on the front end of this journey of discovering the Lord, don't just pick it up one Sunday here, next Sunday there, and wait for a truth here, and kind of kibitz with some of your friends, and then come up with your own idea, and just think that somewhere along the line, it's finally going to hit. Because one thing we can all agree on is this. We do not know the exact moment that we are going to die. 
a 13-year-old boy died in the back of a pickup truck as he was flung out into the street this week. You know that. Do you think if the person driving that truck would have thought that that child would have died, that that person would have been driving? And I'm not here marginalizing. I'm not stink talking. I'm just telling you that things happen that we don't know about. So if you're on your journey of discovering who Christ is, stay on it faithfully, diligently, seeking that truth because you don't know when it's all over. So I encourage you to do that. And maybe this is preacher talk. I'd like to think it's because I really love you. Do it right now. Trust Christ as your Savior right now. He is God. He did die on that cross. He shed His blood. He rose again. He said it's not by any good works we've done. For God so loved you, He said, that He gave His only Son Himself. That if you would believe in Him, not behave and believe, not behave, just believe in Him, you would not perish. Jesus, who never lied, cannot lie, said that. And all you've got to do is to believe that right now. So as a second fiddle and also ram, you can trust Christ. No one can stop you from that except yourself. All right, let's look at the second. What else can we do? How God can use us as a second fiddle and also ram. We can bring those closest to us to Jesus. Now, there are people that are in our sphere of influence that would be close to us, and I thought this was interesting because Andrew, when he really understood who Christ was, notice what it says in verse 41 of John 1. It says this, he, referring to Andrew, first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah. See, he connected, which is translated the Christ. And so he, Andrew, brought him, Peter, to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You're Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Now, I'm not going to make a big deal over what his name means and all of that. We can do that at another time. But there's another truth hidden in here, if you will. It was interesting that when Andrew got this truth, it says he first found his own brother. Now, think about that. I got this truth, and the first person, I got to go tell somebody. I got to go tell somebody. And for him, he wanted to tell his brother. Now, those of you that know the story of Peter, what's interesting about Peter, remember the list, name first, big talker, find him in Scripture, always the one that would do things that were ahead of everybody else, even if it was wrong, his heart was right, but sometimes his thinking and his following was not right, but he did the best he could, he was out in front. I can only believe that that was Peter's personality even before he met Christ. So therefore, Andrew grew up with a dominant brother. And they were in the fishing business together. So do you think that probably Peter was more dominant in setting up the rules for fishing and marketing the fish and getting the things together? Probably pretty strong and pretty much a talker. So Andrew lived his life in the shadow of a dominant brother. And yet with all of that, Andrew said, I have got some truth that my brother needs to hear. Now, it's also interesting, and maybe this is my own assumption here, but when Jesus then said, oh, you're Peter, you're Cephas. Now, I know Jesus knows everything, so it might have come out of his all-knowing, or it could have been that he had the all-knowing, but also Cephas was so well-known because he had such a big mouth anyway that everybody knew about Peter, but who's this Andrew? But Andrew went after his brother. Now, there's also an interesting word in that verse. It says, he first found his own brother. Now, let's use this as an illustration for a moment. I see my sweet wife over here, all right? And so if I wanted to go tell her something, I would walk up to her. I would not say, I found my wife, all right? Why? Because I know where she's at. When Scripture says Andrew found Peter, I have to come to the assumption, the conclusion, that he probably had to go look for him a little bit. Now, there's going to be a time when this service ends and we all start scattering and Carol's going to minister and I'm going to need to meet her because we have an appointment after the service with some people, etc. And we want to start on time and she might not be near me. I will have to go, what? Find her, okay? And so I'll be looking for her. Now, you might say, that's such a minor point. No, it's really not. He was so concerned for his brother that he decided to say no to other things so that he could first find his own brother. And it's interesting that his own brother, he didn't go look for somebody else's brother. So what am I saying simply in this one passage alone? And that is, how many of you have a family member 
that is yet, watch carefully what I'm going to ask, have not yet heard the simple plan of salvation in Christ. I didn't say they haven't heard about Jesus. I believe they have. But they have not yet heard the complete, full, authentic, correct, clear, compassionate, courageous communication of the gospel yet. Do you have a family member like that? You folks that have been a part of our, Mark Carol's and my journey here for a while, you've heard this, what I'm about to say. Would you give me a moment and let me share with our new friends here this. The night that I trusted Christ as my Savior, I was 16. I couldn't wait to get home because I wanted to tell my father. My sister I know would be in bed. I cared about my mom, but my dad and I had this very wonderful relationship ever since I was a little kid. And I don't have time to unpack that. All I can tell you is very special. Now, maybe I was selective. Maybe I was prejudiced. Maybe I was biased. Maybe I was, uh, what do you want to say, uh, favoritism with all the family. I picked dad. I don't know what it was, but I knew I had to tell my dad. I walked in the door about 1 o'clock in the morning after a late night youth meeting that ended late. And my dad was waiting up, rough and tough, hard to diaper, construction guy in painting. And I went to dad and I said, dad, you will not believe what happened to me tonight. I found out that I'm going to heaven and you're going to hell. <laughs> now, I know that wasn't right. I know I didn't take any personal evangelism classes. I didn't have all that stuff. All I know is that I had zeal with not proper knowledge to communicate it. But one thing is that I had the passion. I didn't want my dad to go to hell. Now, yeah, we danced around the dining room table and it was years later before my dad ever trusted in Christ. But I will tell you that when I found Jesus, I then first found my own dad. Now, here's what I'd like you to hear from this very carefully so all of us lean into this. When Andrew brought Peter to Jesus, he could not make Peter embrace Jesus. All he could do was to bring Peter underneath the sound of Jesus or in the presence of Jesus. So here's some good news. The good news is, is that you are not responsible for making any of your family come to faith in Christ. Neither am I. I wish we could, don't you? Those of us, wouldn't, wouldn't we want to be able to sometimes sanctify, shake our family? And you, We can't do that. Because we know if they don't, what a life, an eternal life, they will have. That life will be in hell forever. And so we wish we could, but we can't. So the good news is all we have to do is to bring them to Christ and then leave God to do the work in their life. But now that might give you a lot of relief. But let me just come back a step. Have you brought your family to Christ in a clear, correct presentation of the gospel? Whether you spoke it to them, was it really clear? Was it really correct? I don't know. I'm not judging you. You ask yourself. When you brought them to hear someone, did they give a clear and correct presentation of the gospel? When you gave them literature, was it a clear and correct presentation of the gospel? All we can do, and we're responsible for, is to bring them to that truth, especially of the gospel. And so that's our responsibility. Now, what's so neat about that is second fiddles and also rams can do that. My dad also never saw my uniform dirty. My dad also never read my name in the newspaper. I was a second fiddle. But my dad had a son who, when he heard about Christ, I came barreling home and I couldn't wait to tell that to my dad. A second fiddle can do that. And it also ran. And so we can do that. And whether they trust Christ or not, that is really up to them. It doesn't take away our pain, but at least it's something that we all can do. Here's the third thing that God can do and how he can use us as second fiddles and also rans. Number three, we can bring those most needy and overlooked to Jesus. Now, my goodness, don't we live on a beautiful island with beautiful scenery and beautiful weather and many beautiful people, but how many times we drive around the island and we see people that are extremely needy and sometimes are overlooked. 
And you can read whatever you want to between the lines of what I've just said. This is not a marginalization, a condemnation, or a judgment. All it is is a statement of awareness. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.